So welcome, everyone. I'm Greg Schaefer. It's my huge pleasure to uh, introduce the Brower Lecture. Of course, this is thanks to our good friend, uh, Judge Charles Brower, um, here. And I just, uh, you know, it's thrilled that we're able to offer, the, offer this opportunity every year to have such great lectures. In terms of the history of this lecture, this is the 11th year of the lecture, and the lecture has been held um, with amazing speakers. You can see all online, you know, who the speakers have been over time. And, um, and, uh, and I just want to, um, and this year, it's just, we have an incredible speaker and Sir Christopher Greenwood. Uh, I am so honored to introduce you, Sir Christopher. He has had a storied career in the field of international law, arbitration, and dispute resolution. He served as professor of international law at the London School of Economics until his election as a judge of the International Court of Justice in 2009. He was called to the bar by Middle Temple in 1978 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 1999 and has been a member of Land Building Essex Court Chambers and 24 Lincoln's Inn Fields. During his time as a barrister, Sir Christopher regularly appeared as counsel before the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the English courts, arbitral and other tribunals. He has extensive experience as an arbitrator, both in interstate and investor state cases, and currently sits as a member of the Iran and United States Claim Tribunal, and is a member of the ICSID panel of arbitrators. Sir Christopher was appointed Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in 2002, and knighted in 2009 for services to international law. In 2018, he was made Knight Grand Cross for his services to international justice. Sir Christopher, <laughs> it's my honor to hear you. Thank you. Well, Greg, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, the organizers of today's conference have done a very dangerous thing. They've put me in a room where there is no clock. So I will try not to overrun and to allow time for questions. Um, a newly ordained clergyman once asked a very experienced priest how he should know when a sermon should stop. And the older priest said, well, don't take any notice if they look at their watches. They always do that. But when they start taking them off and shaking them, then it's time to sit down. <laughs> it's a great honor and a pleasure to be asked to give the 11th Brower Lecture here at the Society. I've known Charlie Brower for 30 years. I first met him when I was a relatively callow youngster in the Lockerbie case at the International Court of Justice. I was the very junior counsel for the United Kingdom, wisely not given a speaking part. And Charlie was one of those who was speaking on behalf of the United States. And as I sat in one of the back rows, I watched him and I thought, that's the best dressed back in international law. <laughs> Although, Charlie, I have to tell you, the sartorial prize at that particular hearing was stolen from you by the Libyan agent who turned up in a white toga and a black silk skull cap. Um, he was the one who got all the attention from the television cameras. There's something else that many people in this room will know about Charlie, and that is that if he asks to have a conversation with you on the telephone, it's going to cost you. He is the president's secret weapon in raising money for the society. Two of my predecessors referred to their bodies still bearing the scars. Um, all I can say, Charlie, is you're an expensive person to know. <laughs> now, looking back on the previous 10 lectures, they cover some of the most marvelous topics you could imagine in the field of international dispute settlement. Starting with Johnny Vida, whose premature death we, we all greatly mourn, talking about the Alabama case, 
And then going on, David Caron's talk again, somebody we've sadly lost far too early, on what arbitrators and adjudicators are really there to do. Daniel Bethlehem posing some very difficult questions about how IDS might develop in the future. And Lucy Reed looking at how international dispute settlement can react to crises like COVID. So this leaves me with a problem. How to say anything that hasn't been said already and said better? Well, I asked Greg for some advice and his suggestion was that I should draw on my own experience. Now that's the second dangerous thing that has been done. Um, there's an old saying that you know when a man is old because he enters his anecdotage. And I fear I may be in danger of doing that. But I thought I would take the theme of this year's annual meeting and look at IDS in relation to it. The reach and limits of international law to solve today's challenges. And that gives us the opportunity, I think, for a stock taking on where we are and a chance to ask some hard questions, which perhaps, as lawyers, we don't always ask sufficiently frequently. I'm not going to talk about the criminal courts. They're a subject all their own. By dispute settlement, I mean, for these purposes, cases in which there is a dispute that turns on public international law between two parties, who are, or more than two parties in some cases, who at least for the purposes of the litigation appear on a footing of equality. And that will include, for example, national courts dealing with points of international law. Um, one of my happy memories of the American society is coming here for a conference and being told as soon as I got back to England by my clerk that I was to appear in the Pinochet case in the House of Lords, then the equivalent of our Supreme Court today. And I said, oh, great, this was a Monday morning. When? The day after tomorrow, he said, could you please come straight down to London? Um, so it gave me some experience of how to argue international law in a domestic court and how to do it with very little notice. The scars from that experience are even more marked than the scars from my last conversation with Charlie. <laughs> now, if we look at the picture of international dispute settlement today, I think two features stand out. The first is its vitality, and the second, the variety of tribunals that are dealing with these matters today. Vitality, look at the International Court of Justice. 14 cases on its books at the moment. All right, one of them has been moribund for years. Yes, it had more cases a couple of years ago, but look at the sort of cases it's dealing with today and compare that with the 1970s, when it basically had nothing to do at all. My wife has never forgiven me for becoming a judge at one of the busier periods in the court's life, rather than in the 1970s. Interstate arbitration is more vital than it's ever been before. ITLOS, the World Trade Organization, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, the Ethiopia-Eritrea Claims Commission, now having finished its work, the UN Compensation Commission, the last 30 years have seen an explosion of more cases, more important cases, and a wider variety of tribunals dealing with them. And that's at the interstate level. Look also at what has been happening in cases between states and private parties, individuals, corporations. Again, the Iran-US, although now dealing with interstate work, spent most of its history dealing with cases brought by private claimants. In the human rights field, the European Court of Human Rights, whose jurisprudence, when I was a student, could be fitted into one volume, is now dealing with something like 40,000 cases a year, and has been followed by the African Court of Human and People's Rights, the Inter-American Court and Commission of Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Committee, the specialist committees dealing with the various human rights treaties. An investor-state dispute settlement which was in its infancy when I was a student, has exploded with a number of cases and indeed a fair number of criticisms of that process. I'll come back to that at a later stage. <laughs> 
And there's been an increased role for domestic courts as well. The first international case I was involved in in Britain was the International Tin Council litigation in the late 80s. In one of those hearings, the judge at the time said, ah, yes, international law. I know about that. English law is law, foreign law is fact, international law is fiction. <laughs> the House of Lords didn't exactly cover itself in glory by suggesting that the banks and brokers who were the claimants in that case should go to the International Court of Justice instead. As I tell my students, if you're a law lord, you can make that mistake. If you're taking the Tripos paper next month, you can't. <laughs> And within 10 years, that had been completely transformed into an environment in which English courts at all levels were dealing with points of international law. And the same has been true in courts in a wide range of countries. So on its face, international dispute settlement has never been in a better place. Not to say it can't be better still, but there's more of it, it's more important, it's more interesting. So that's the time to ask the difficult questions. And I want to ask three. The first is, are we expecting the wrong things from investor state dispute, so, sorry, from invest, I'll try again, from international dispute settlement. It's these initials that cause all the trouble, <laughs> IDS, ISDS, and everything else. We should avoid them as far as possible. Now, David Caron dealt with this in his Brower lecture a few years ago, but I want to take it a little bit further. He rightly pointed out that the idealism of the very beginning of the 20th century, which built on the Alabama arbitration and saw arbitration, adjudication, as the alternative to war, was always expecting too much. And the history of the next 50 years vividly made that point. International courts are not peacemakers. International courts can contribute to peace, and often do, but they, t they are dealing with an individual, isolated, legal dispute. They cannot be expected to act as some kind of mediator on the broader political environment of that dispute. Now, quite rightly, Courts have taken the view that the fact that there is a broader political environment is not a reason for not dealing with the legal issue. But the legal issue has to be isolated. It cannot be muddled up with political mediation. Now, in one sense, that's a great advantage of the international legal system. It levels the playing field between the parties by isolating a legal issue and dealing with the parties on a footing of equality. Whereas once you get out into the wider political realm, the more powerful state is always in a much stronger position. Look for an example at the Rainbow Warrior litigation. The legal issue isolated and dealt with first placed New Zealand and France on a footing of equality. The broader political issue with France just dropping a hint about the New Zealand butter concession coming up for renewal in the European community, as it then was, is a very different matter indeed. But that does mean that we often overestimate what can be achieved by an international court. Even in a relatively minor dispute, it's unlikely to bring peace just through a single judgment. Of course, it can do. In the Alabama is a striking example of that because the years running up to the arbitration saw Britain and America come closer to uh, war than they had been since the British burned the White House, and we're still sorry for that, by the way. Um, it, it, it was a reprisal for your lot burning Toronto. I think that has to be said, but uh, even so, the run-up to the Alabama arbitration saw two major powers in a state of very considerable tension. The effect of the award was to lance a boil which might have poisoned relations between them for a generation or more. And you only have to look at some of the longer running disputes, for example, in Latin America, to see how what from the outside can appear a relatively minor dispute can have a totally distorting effect 
in terms of relations between two governments. But that depends on a willingness on the part of the two states to accept third-party adjudication and to live with the result of that adjudication. Britain paid up immediately in respect of the Alabama case. But had the case gone the way that some people in America had hoped, with the indirect damages claim, which in today's money is hard to compute, but something like three trillion US dollars, there is no doubt the British would have walked away from the case. They could not have afforded to do anything else. So you have to see this, I think, in a reasonable perspective. And that's particularly a problem in the International Court of Justice because the nature of its jurisdiction means that very often it can only deal with a part of the legal dispute. If you look at the two genocide co convention cases between Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia and Serbia, there's no question you could have raised a serious legal dispute about breaches of the Geneva Conventions, breaches of the United Nations Charter, any number of other issues. But the court only had jurisdiction to rule on the genocide point. Now, that's something which I confess will probably haunt me to my grave, because I sat in the Croatia-Serbia case, and I can remember one of the witnesses saying at the end of her testimony, I want to know by what right they came to my village, murdered my family, destroyed our community. And I thought that we are never going to be able to answer that question. That's a, a prime example of the difference between expectations and reality. I should say a more light-hearted element of that case was that once we gave our judgment on the 3rd of February 2015, as Judge Sepulveda will recall, there was then an attack on the court in the leading daily newspaper in Dubrovnik for having deliberately added insult to injury by giving our judgment on the day of the patron saint of Dubrovnik. I have to confess I didn't know who the patron saint was <laughs> or when his saint's day fell. For those of you who like pub quiz questions, it's St. Blaise and it's the 3rd of February. Um, I don't think an international court could be expected to have those kind of political antennae. Now, if you look at that list of cases currently before the International Court of Justice, I'm not going to name any, but just look at that list. Most of them are very different from the cases where the legal issue sits on its own. There are some very high stakes, complicated political considerations behind at least half of the cases currently on the agenda of the court. And that inevitably means that expectations of what the court will do will be out of sync with what it is actually able to do. I also think an international court should not be seen as the way of righting a perceived wrong from hundreds of years ago. If it behaves like a court, it will apply the law in force at the date the events in question happened, however distasteful that law might seem to us today. If it doesn't do that, it has no business calling itself a court at all. It's instead trying to rewrite history. Nor, I think, should we expect an international court or tribunal to be the prime agent for change? Of course, every time a court or an arbitration tribunal gives a judgment or award, at least if it's public, it is refining and developing the law. It will make a difference to how we see the law hereafter. But I, whereas American society can survive both Roe and Wade and the reversal of Roe and Wade, I do not think international society could do. I do not think it has the degree of cohesion to be able to cope with that kind of change being legislated, in effect, by a court of law. And while I think the decision of the General Assembly to seek an advisory opinion on climate change is very interesting, and it may produce some very fruitful results, I strongly imagine that people will expect a great deal more from that advisory opinion than the court is going to be able to deliver. And there is a real danger in that, because if we expect too much through litigation, 
It takes the attention away from other things that need to be done. Anyone who imagines that the request for an advisory opinion means we can all down our pencils as far as climate change is concerned and stop looking at other means of developing the reality, not just the law, is, I think, living in cloud cuckoo land. Now, let me turn from that to my second hard question. Is the variety of international dispute settlement means actually a recipe for chaos? Do we really have an international legal system when it comes to dispute settlement? You have the International Court of Justice taking one view about state responsibility and being contradicted by the, inter the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, which for reasons best known to itself, decided it needed to opine on a subject that didn't actually arise in the case in front of it. You have the European Court of Justice in the Achmea and Comstroy cases, taking views about, first of all, bilateral treaties, and then the Energy Charter Treaty, to which more than a third of the parties are not EU member states anyway, and doing it on the basis of principles of EU constitutional law, rather than general international law. You have the constant risk that a human rights tribunal is going to take the position, this is what the human rights treaty we apply means. We frankly don't care what the rest of international law might have to say. You could say the same, perhaps, about investor state tribunals, ignoring environmental law, as we've just heard from the previous panel. And you have the complete divergence of views about whether a most favored nation clause in a BIT can alter the jurisdiction of a tribunal, a subject on which, in a lecture to honor Judge Brower, I'm going to tread very carefully indeed. Now, we all like the idea of a system, especially those of us who are or have been academics. We like the bits to fit together neatly. We like to complete the jigsaw. But I don't think we actually need to do that in international dispute settlement. I think the danger of chaos is greatly overrated. One of the reasons why the dispute between the ICJ and the ICTY about state responsibility gets trotted out in every article about fragmentation of international law is it's the only clear example that there is. And it has made almost no difference whatsoever in practice to the development and application of international law. In the world of human rights, the International Court of Justice in the nuclear weapons case went a long way to reconciling international humanitarian law with the global human rights treaties. And the European Court of Human Rights very bravely has done the same with a much more difficult treaty because of the difference in wording. Unlike the uh, Covenant, for example, which talks about arbitrary detention or arbitrary taking of life, the European Convention prohibits detention, prohibits taking of life, and then lists some very narrow exceptions to that general prohibition. But in the Hassan case, the European Court of Human Rights, by a majority of six to one, decided that provided that somebody who was taken prisoner as a prisoner of war was treated in accordance with the Prisoner of War Convention, there wouldn't be a breach of Article 5 of the European Convention. And in Jones and the United Kingdom, it took a broadly similar view about state immunity and human rights. So I think it's not unreasonable to say that the risk here has been overstated. It's also worth asking, what could we actually do if it wasn't overstated? There were some suggestions about 25 years ago that the International Court of Justice could be either a final court of appeal from every arbitration tribunal applying international law, um, Joan Donoghue isn't here today, but I imagine that her intray would look rather intimidating if that were to be the case. Or possibly the ICJ could be a, a court of reference like the European Court of Justice to which national courts could refer for a preliminary ruling on a point of international law. That strikes me as an even worse possibility and neither strikes me as even remotely likely since it would require an amendment of the statute and thus of the Charter of the United Nations. But while we have to recognize, I think, that the risk is not as great as it's been trumped out to be, and that the way of dealing with it is pretty limited, 
Let's not underestimate the difficulties. 20 arbitration tribunals divide almost equally between those who said MFN clauses did expand their jurisdiction and those who said they didn't. They were all these cases against Argentina, and in many cases, the difference between tribunals concerned the same BITs. That does no credit to any system of international law, however varied and diversified. And then my third question is perhaps the hardest of them all. I'm now going to shake my watch just to make sure I'm not going, to, going on for too long. Is the growth of international dispute settlement necessarily a good thing? Now, even to ask that question, especially to ask it here, is surely an example of heresy for which in an earlier age, I would probably have been burned um, in front of the bookstalls outside. It's also a prime example of somebody who has made his living out of international adjudication, breaking his own rice bowl. So it won't surprise you to hear me say that on the whole, I think the increased use of international adjudication has benefited international society and not just international law and its lawyers. But Oscar Schachter, in a later round of the Lockerbie case, started his speech by saying there's an old proverb, to a shoemaker, there's nothing like leather. Well, to a lawyer, there's nothing like a court. But the truth is that you can make shoes out of things other than leather. And if you ever tried fishing in a deep water river um, or wading through the puddles in Wellington boots, you'll know that leather isn't always the best thing from which to make a pair of shoes. And a court isn't always the best way to resolve a dispute, even if it has a legal content. Let's look briefly at some of the possible dangers. First of all, I think there is a real risk in trying to strain jurisdictional provisions in treaties to accommodate a case which is actually about something different. States, it seems to me, are entitled to know what it is they are signing up for when they sign up for it. They're entitled to do it because not to do that is unfair, but also if states feel that they're being cheated and that jurisdictional provisions are being given a distorted interpretation, there is something else they can do. They can just leave. And I think there is a danger that those of us trained in a domestic law environment, as we all are, where compulsory adjudication is taken for granted, we overlook the fact that states have other options. Look at how many states have withdrawn their declarations under the optional clause after they have lost a case in the International Court of Justice. An interesting example of that, which I sat on, um, is the, temp the Temple of Prey over here, the second case. After losing the first case, Thailand withdrew its acceptance of the optional clause. So when some 40 years later, we get more than 40 years, 50 years later, we get a brand new case from Cambodia, it has to be a request for interpretation of the earlier judgment. And that's again an example of the divergence between expectation and reality. Because lots of people, including many who should have known better, expected the court essentially to draw a workable boundary between the two states. But we didn't have jurisdiction to do that. All we had jurisdiction to do is to work out what our predecessors had meant 50 years earlier. And I'm afraid without the assistance of a medium and a Ouija board, there was no way of asking them what they might have thought. Um, I think there is a real danger also in playing fast and loose with temporal limitations on the jurisdiction of international tribunals. A state, or indeed any other party, ought to be able to know that in accepting a voluntary jurisdiction, it's not exposing itself to a vast and impossible array of litigation about the past. And that's particularly important in international law because we do not have a statute of limitations. There may be individual provisions in particular um, uh, treaties, particular statutes of courts, but there's no overall rule that you've got to bring your case within three years or six years or 60 years or 600 years. And frankly, 
we're not in a position to go back and rewrite history. And indeed, there is, I think, a danger that isn't spotted by those who want to see a radical development of international law. It is much easier to do that if you are doing it for the future or for the very recent past. It is a great deal more difficult if you are untying the arrangements made at the end of World War II or World War I or the Crimean War, for that matter. Go back as far as you like. A limitation, whether it's in the acceptance of jurisdiction or some general rule of international law that you must bring your case within a reasonable period of time, is something which actually facilitates the development of international law rather than hindering it. The second area where I think we, we need to ask, is it really such a good thing, is the willingness on the part of some courts to confuse issues of jurisdiction with issues of merits. Now look, anyone who's been a judge, or for that matter a litigator, has been here. If the merits of the case are overwhelmingly in favour of one party, it's a huge temptation to find that you had jurisdiction and not throw the case out on a preliminary ground. The European Court of Justice, very radical on some things, when it comes to judicial review of the institutions, uh, the political institutions of the European Union, has shamelessly allowed the merits to colour its view of jurisdiction, um, even though its view of jurisdiction has generally been extremely constrained. I think you see that in particular in the way in which jus cogens is trotted out as a concept which can be used somehow to override a jurisdictional limitation. A particularly graphic example of that was the way in which many people were critical of the court's judgment in the Congo-Rwanda case, where one of the arguments by Congo, and I should declare an interest, I was counsel for Rwanda in this case, one of the arguments of Congo was that the reservation made by Rwanda to the Genocide Convention whereby it did not accept the provision on international court jurisdiction, should somehow be overridden by reference to a concept of jus cogens. Now, the court rejected that, but it's worth looking at what a scandal it would have been if the court had gone the other way, because only a few years earlier, it had automatically struck off cases against Spain and the United States brought by the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia where precisely the same argument about jus cogens and the reservation to the Genocide Convention had been used. To uphold that reservation in a case against the United States, and then to reject it in a case against Rwanda, a country that really has suffered genocide, rather than just being one where the subject is written about, would surely have been inexcusable at any level. You see it also in some of the arguments raised in the Germany and Italy case about sovereign immunity and in the Jones and Saudi Arabia case in the United Kingdom. I do not think it is acceptable for courts to confuse questions of merits with questions of jurisdiction. And there are still too many, I fear, who are willing to listen to the siren song that we should do that. And since Philippa Webb is here, um, I hope she won't be too embarrassed if I say I have grave reservations about the Supreme Court's decision in the Wong case on diplomatic immunity and the trafficking of a domestic servant. Um, to, uh, to hold by a very narrow majority that bringing in a servant whom you are not properly paying is engaging in a commercial activity, um, whereas the ordinary employment of a servant would not be, I find a little difficult to understand. And then th lastly, one comment about the danger that might be there in the growing role of domestic courts in hearing cases on international law. Now, there are many cases which national courts have to hear. The Venezuelan gold dispute between the two claimants to be the government of Venezuela could only have been heard in the United Kingdom because that's where the gold is deposited. The Pinochet case, though it might look like an example of far-reaching extraterritorial jurisdiction actually turns on whether we take seriously or not the jurisdiction provisions in the Convention Against Torture. Because Pinochet's argument that he was entitled to immunity 
because what he had done, he had done in his official capacity, is an argument that could be raised by any official of any government or any former official. And since the Convention Against Torture only applies to officials, the effect would be to negate that jurisdictional provision completely. But is it sensible for national courts to set themselves up as a kind of court of claims for dealing with disputes that have nothing to do with them whatsoever, nothing to do with that country whatsoever? Especially since when they do that, they don't always get their international law right. I think if one looks at some of the Alien Tort Claims Act cases, they leave you with a rather uncomfortable feeling that this wasn't actually international law that was being applied. Indeed, I gave an expert opinion along with the late Professor James Crawford in one of those cases. And in the next round of pleading, the other party lambasted what we had said, said, the views of the British professors, well, that was an insult to James, who was a proud Australian <laughs> and a member of the Order of Australia. The British professors have not cited a single instance of Second Circuit international law. <laughs> There's no such thing as Second Circuit international law. There is international law. If the Second Circuit can't get it right, so much the worse for the Second Circuit. Now, to finish, I was always told never to say that in a speech because as soon as you did, people would start to make tea at the back of the room. But fortunately, this is a better organized conference. The reach of international dispute settlement and its limits is a subject that we need to look at more carefully than we have tended to look at it in the past. It calls for a degree of idealism. To quote Robert Browning, a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? But it also calls for a degree of realism. We should not pretend that international courts and other methods of dispute settlement can do things that in fact they cannot. We should not put all our faith in dealing with a problem like climate change into the lap of an advisory opinion requested by the General Assembly. We should not pretend that every court that deals with a point of international law is going to get it right. And that's why I'm so much in favour of the judicial outreach programme of the society, because it is important that a judge who spends most of their time dealing with something completely different, confronted with a point of international law, is given the equipment, the material with which to resolve it. So idealism on the one hand, realism on the other. International dispute settlement has come a long way in the time I've been a member of this society. It will, I think, go very much further in the time that the younger people here in this audience will, I hope, still be members of the American society. But let us not go too far beyond its reach and its limits. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, first of all, for that speech. But then if you have a question, there's a microphone there in which you can stand in line. So, please. Somebody have a question that they'd like? The credible opportunity. I'm never sure whether the total absence of questions is a good thing for the lecture <laughs> or a bad one. <laughs> oh. so. Lucinda Lowe, please. Identify yourself, if you would. Lu Lucinda a... Lowe, Steptoe and Johnson, former president of the Society. Thank you for a marvelous exposition. I do have a question. You mentioned the WTO at the outset, and of course we all know that at this time the dispute settlement body of the WTO is dysfunctional and, and fractured. And we're also in a time where we see growing um, regionalism, growing uh, a move away from globalization. So give us your thoughts on how that might affect dispute settlement efforts in the future. Yes, I think, um, interestingly, the reason why it's dysfunctional, um, can you hear me all right? I think, I think I've got this microphone switched on. Um, 
The reason why it's dysfunctional is that uh, the United States has refused to approve the appointment or reappointment of members of the appellate mechanism. And a number of other states have effectively contracted out and decided that they will accept temporary appointments which will enable their uh, disputes into sea to be resolved this way. Um, I think this is a good example, really, of the outer limit of what can be achieved by law and adjudication. At a time when globalism was all the rage, the idea of resolving disputes about protectionist practices by reference to the WTO dispute settlement mechanism became very attractive. Now that there is, I think, a much more widespread um, retrenchment towards protectionism, which you see in all sorts of manifestations in my own country in the decision to leave the European Union. Um, what I think you get there is what I was saying about the level playing field, the desire of a state that has a greater degree of economic power. So, well, I'm not going to accept losing cases in the WTO. They can come, the other state can come and talk to me, and we'll talk about this in the broader context of our trade relations, um, which might be a perfectly plausible way of dealing uh, if, for example, you're China, um, doesn't look quite so good if you're Costa Rica trying to deal with the United States on that. Uh, so I think it really comes down to the question of whether we wish to preserve uh, the current body of trade legislation that is in force, or whether we want to move back to something more akin to the system of retaliation and um, political negotiation. Uh, and I think the, you know, there are arguments to be made, frankly, on both sides of that one. Uh, there can be a sclerosis in dispute settlement mechanisms which doesn't do anyone any good. Uh, I think that was one of the things that upset a large number of voters in my own country. It's also, however, worth looking and seeing, well, never mind this dispute. What do we have to gain from the system as a whole? And that's where I have to say I don't think the US decision is a sensible one. I don't think it will help the United States in the longer run. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, Marsha Wiss, practitioner, <clears throat> and I teach at Georgetown Law and Johns Hopkins Sice. I just came back from a very excellent panel in that direction about investor state uh, dispute resolution enforcement in which the speaker from the University of Oslo with data showed that, in fact, um, I think about 60% of all um, IS investor state dispute resolution awards are not enforced or there's no evidence of enforcement. Um, what do you think the future of a mechanism, maybe ICSID, maybe <clears throat> other resolutions of bilateral investment treaties is, if there's ineffective enforcement? That's a problem for international law as a whole. Um, uh, what I always used to say when students asked about enforcement in international law was just to ask them, suppose you are appearing for usually the father, if it's in Britain, in a child custody dispute. The judge orders that the mother should have practical custody. There are various things about shared custody in law and so on, but in practice you can only be sleeping in one house at a time uh, you know, on any given night. And with smaller children, it's usually um, that practical custody usually rests with the mother. But the order is that the father shall have access at the weekends or whatever, and the mother refuses to comply. How do you enforce that? Well, for years, the answer in Britain was you couldn't because the courts weren't going to lock up the mother for contempt, because that was going to harm the children. When I was in China a few years ago, I, I read in the um, English language newspaper in the hotel that roughly 60-70% of commercial court judgments in China are not enforced. And there are mechanisms of enforcement available within China which perhaps go rather beyond the mechanisms of enforcement available um, for enforcing an ISDS award. I wonder whether that statistic, I couldn't go to that particular panel, I was at a very interesting panel on the environment and um, the right to, to a healthy and sustainable environment and how international dispute settlement might affect that. 
which was just what I wanted to hear minutes before I was giving my own lecture. Um, it's a bit like being told there's a new judgment of the Supreme Court when you're on your way into the exam hall. Um, the, I think that may be distorted by the Spanish solar power cases, which not only are numerically very significant, but also the amounts of money are very large and therefore likely to have a bigger effect. Um, that may not be the case. Obviously, if judgments are not enforced, if awards are not enforced, then the tribunal loses a degree of credibility. Robbie Jennings, one of my predecessors on the International Court, used to say, though, that almost every judgment the International Court of Justice has ever given has been complied with in the end. Sometimes it takes 40 or 50 years, <laughs> but they're all complied with in the end. Thank and I you. can only think of two cases in recent times that haven't been. So I don't think the picture's as bad as it's sometimes painted. Okay. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Genevieve McCarthy. I'm a law student at Georgetown. Um, do you have any thoughts on best practices for US practitioners um, who want to get involved in treaty negotiations or international courts like the ICJ or even the ICC um, than to have the US not sign on or to um, protest those mechanisms? Um, maybe individual best practices for U.S. negotiators in those situations, or maybe ideas for how people from the U.S. can participate in some type of change there. Well, I, I think the answer is it's how you influence your own government on this. And I'm always a little cautious about expressing a view on that. Um, the last time people from my country tried to tell Americans how to run their affairs, it didn't end terribly well, for us at least. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think there is a sad reluctance on the part of the US body politic generally to engage in a lot of areas of international treaty making. It's partly a reflection of the very close division that you have in the Senate at the moment, and indeed in the electorate more generally. But if you go back, say, to the 60s, the US took the lead in most of these negotiations, uh, and it's sad that it's not doing so any longer. Uh, again, remember there was one occasion when the US decided to opt out of the whole thing, and that was the League of Nations. I don't think anyone today would say that was a great success for the United States, never mind being a success for anybody else. Uh, so I, I wish you luck with it, but I'm not sure I can give you any advice about <laughs> how to do it. I thought you were asking how, you know, for some career advice, and I'll give you that Which I quickly. Would love. Yes, please. Get yourself called to a bar somewhere. The great, the, the, the great sadness I found over the years, I worked with lots of brilliant young people I used to sit there on selection panels and think, thank goodness they don't put the judges through this. But they weren't professionally qualified. They had a PhD, a couple of master's degrees, sure, but no bar would let them argue a case. And you are hamstrung in terms of your ability to make a difference if you don't have that professional qualification. The other thing is if you want to learn how to draft treaties, Go and spend some time in the State Department, or if you're not from the United States, one of the other foreign ministries, because you'll get a better training in it there than you will ever get anywhere else. So that's, that's a couple of free bits of career advice to make up for the fact I can't give you any political advice. <laughs> yes, please. Good morning, sir. My name is Luis Parada. I am a, an attorney here in the US, but before being an attorney, I was uh, in the military of my home country of El Salvador. And I was in the military during the Civil War from 1980 to 1992. I was actually stayed till 94. And I want to ask you a question about what you've said about rewriting history. And not necessarily applying a different law, but applying a different understanding of the same law from what it was back, you know, three decades ago. And in, and I have a real life situation, a specific situation with regard to the peace agreement that ended the Salvadoran Civil War in 1992. Negotiating the peace agreement, there was a partial amnesty mm -hmm. for only for the insurgents so that they could come back in, into the country and be reinserted into political life. 
and indeed they came back as they were the ones who were abroad and the ones that deposed their, their weapons became a political party and eventually ended up being the government of the country elected for two terms. That was made possible because of that amnesty, that partial amnesty that had exceptions for the cases that the Truth Commission would see. And at the time it was accepted as proper under the second additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions to the extent that they applied to the insurgents, which was a news to me that they are also subject to the article, common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions. But anyway, back then even the Secretary General of the UN signed that peace agreement and referred to that amnesty as something good that allowed for the return of the FMLN rebels. But now, 31 years later, it seems like amnesties of all sorts are being looked at as uh, with an unfavorable light and the government of El Salvador is now charging some former rebels, including one of the commanders of the rebels that signed the peace agreement for a killing one person during the Civil War. So uh, with, how should we deal with when uh, you didn't change the law, you just changed the, the, your understanding mm -hmm. of what the law at the time meant to what it is now and you judge cases now based on the new understanding instead of the understanding at the time. And what does that do for countries' abilities to end civil wars and have peace if the rules are gonna change 30 years down the road? Well, I have every sympathy for, for you and your countrymen about this. You could raise much the same question in relation to the peace process in Northern Ireland uh, where in the end, the courts, both on the mainland and in uh, Northern Ireland, took the view that those people who had been told that they would not be at risk of prosecution could not be prosecuted, because to do so would be a breach of, it would be an abuse of process. Now, I have to say, I, I perhaps out on a limb about this, I am not a great enthusiast for what has become the principle in international affairs that there can be no peace without justice and you've got to bring everyone who commits a crime to a court. Um, I have a child of my own who's in the British military and I have to ask myself, you know, in, in relation to the various operations she's taken part in, would I wish her to put her life at risk because the conflict is ongoing and it's ongoing because it's been impossible to settle due to the unavailability of an amnesty provision. And I, I'd ask any of you to ask yourself the same question. Would you be willing to do that? It sounds great, the idea of saying, there must be no amnesties. And maybe for a certain sort of criminal, there shouldn't be. But the idea you cannot have peace without it is frankly complete nonsense. Look at what happened in Europe and the Far East at the end of the Second World War. Oh yes, we talk about the Nuremberg trial, which I think involved 22 people. And there was a raft of other trials involving several thousand more. But the reality was that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who had committed war crimes or crimes against humanity were never prosecuted because it, the view was taken, amongst others, by General Mark Clark, who was the military governor of the American zone in Germany, that it was simply too disruptive of the attempt to rebuild a peaceful Germany. Um, so I, I think this is a real moral dilemma, uh, and my heart goes out to you about it. That's, I, I fear, all I can really say. Yes, Thank sir. And, uh, Thank I'm finding myself in the situation as a former military officer. I'm actually helping in the defense of the former insurgents. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Yes. This is our last question, and then we'll have to, so please be brief. Yes. Introduce Hi. yourself first. Yes. Yeah, my name is Sean Rogers. I'm a student at Georgetown Law. Um, you mentioned the Second Circuit's confusion, for lack of a better term, about international law. Uh, but scholars like Andrea Roberts have identified differences in the way national courts interpret international law. And I was wondering how you think um, the phenomenon of 
differences of national court interpretations of international law might contribute to the development of international law going forward? Well, I should perhaps have spent a bit longer on this, uh, and I don't want to single out the Second Circuit in particular. <laughs> no, of course, I did. Um, I'll say something about the Ninth Circuit. In a <laughs> Any national court applying international law is going to do it differently from the way the International Court of Justice would apply the same rule of international law. It's constrained by its own constitution. It's constrained by principles like, in English law, the supremacy of an act of parliament. Um, it is the sovereign power of the Queen and Parliament to violate international laws, uh, one court said. And that remains the case. It's not, of course, a defense in international law. More importantly, you have concepts such as a doctrine of binding precedent, which means a tendency to look at what your own courts have done at the expense of what others might be doing. You have um, a cultural difference, particularly a problem, I think, with procedure in international courts, because it isn't the same as the procedure that we're used to in our own national system, and that is really something in our DNA as lawyers. And that can give rise to difficulties. But my problem is a different one. Once you've accepted that the, the uh, court in Britain or the US can apply this particular rule of custom or this particular treaty, it should be honest and say what we are doing is we are applying a rule of international law. We're not applying a Second Circuit international law or an English Court of Appeal version of international law. And my great hero in the law, Lord Denning, um, was the past master at this. If any of you ever read Denning's judgments, if they quote the Bible or Shakespeare, it means that precedent is going out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> In the famous case, which is a case called Trentex in Nigeria, which established the principle of restrictive sovereign immunity in English law, the first 20 pages of Lord Denning's judgment are setting out all the precedents in England which say that sovereign immunity is absolute. He then says, but as Shakespeare says in Julius Caesar, <laughs> he had a lovely Hampshire accent. There is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. My lords, are we to miss this tide? And as soon as I read that, I thought the Central Bank of Nigeria is losing this case. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't think it's too bad. Yes, <laughs> great. You. I just want to thank, can we thank Sir Christopher? It was for his insightful remarkable, uh, remarks and for his generosity of taking your questions. And thank you for Judge Brower for making this possible for all these years. Thank you.